Grab your Bibles. Grab any electronic device in which you have a Bible app on. Feel free to use that. Uh, as always, I just want to encourage you to stay focused on the Bible app and don't check your social media and all that stuff. Also, if you're uh, for those of you who are watching online, make sure that there's no distractions around you. Uh, so, uh, let's y'all y'all ready to jump in? Yeah. All right. Well, hold those Bibles up. This is my Bible. This is my Bible. The Word of God. And inside, God tells me the plans he has for my life. He tells me how much he loves me, even when this world tells me that I am not lovable. And I shall be all that God desires for me to be. Because his Holy Spirit dwells inside of me. And this I proclaim. In Jesus' name, In Jesus name. Amen. amen, amen. So here's where we're going to be at today. We're going to be in Exodus 14. And listen, guys, keep your energy up because we even get to, uh, at the end of this worship gathering, we get to see, uh, be a witness, get to be an encourager, get to be a prayer a partner of seeing something just great takes, take place. And that's going to be, we're going to see the second ordinance. The church only has two ordinances. One is the Lord's Supper. And the other is baptism. The Lord's Supper, we do often, okay? We, we, we do it often. We can do it every day. We can do it several times a day. A baptism for a believer only happens once in their life. And so today we get to see uh, baptisms take place. And so we're very excited about that. And we're always excited about journeying in the Word of God because we believe we come face to face with God and God always causes transformation in our life. So in Exodus 14, and I'm going to navigate it through. And you all know that since I'm a short, uh, I, 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 I preach very short. I, I mean, you all know that. Come work with me. Work with me. Work, work with me. Now, you, you're supposed to say, that's right, Pastor. You're always short. All right. Work, work with me. Okay. I want to keep your energy up because I know we got a lot to do. And we're going to jump into this word. So there's three points that I want to share with you from Exodus 14. You, you, get, you have to understand, I'm doing your favor. I actually saw nine. Seriously, but I'm going to show you three, all right? But I saw nine, all right? All right, now, y'all treat me right, and I won't go over the three, all right? All right, so in Exodus chapter three is where we're going to be, and Exodus, did I say Exodus? Well, somewhere in Exodus three, all right? Y'all work, y'all work with me now, okay? So here we are, Exodus 14. And many, I said it right, Exodus 14. Listen, here's the thing. When we go through this, I want you guys to write notes. Uh, listen, things that are highlighted to you, not by me. Amen. By the Spirit of God. I not only want you to highlight it, I want you to go back through the week. And I want you to focus in on it. Because it's a reason why the Spirit of God made that a highlight for you. And so, there are many things that caught my attention in this passage. This is a familiar passage with uh, many of you. And this is where we look at that mean old Pharaoh and his army. And here's a spoiler alert, spoiler alert, spoiler alert. They're going to drown in the Red Sea. All right. But I want you to look at this particular passage, and we're going to focus, I want to do it differently, instead of me reading through it at the top, I'm just going to read through it as we go through the points, okay? But I want you to just think about this one verse as a highlight right now. The highlight verse that I want you to think about right now is verses 13, 13, and 14. It says, and Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you and you have only to be silent. Yeah. And so we're going to talk today about Trusting God in troubled waters. Trusting God in troubled waters. And here's the reality. 
every person in this room is either going through something Amen. or they just came out Amen. of something. A trial, a struggle, a challenge, or they're about to go through something. Yes, no one gets to skate free through this world. Nowhere in the Bible, and I don't know why people think this, nowhere in the Bible it says that if you give your life to Jesus Christ, that you will not suffer. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that if you give your life to Jesus Christ, that if you become saved, that you will be insulated from pain. Nowhere in God's word does it say that if you surrender all to Jesus Christ, that you will not have tribulation, trials, or challenges that you have to deal with. It did not say that as a child of God that there would be no obstacles in your life. It's nowhere in the Bible. It, it, it's, it's the same challenges and struggles that the unbeliever goes through. Many of those challenges are available for the believer as well. We have to deal with troubled waters. And as we look around the room, you may not know it because everyone looks so beautiful with their smile. You may not know that the person you're sitting to is actually in the middle of troubled waters. You may not know that the person that you're sitting next to is actually walking into troubled waters. And you may not even recognize that the person that you're sitting to is almost like a person that has been shipwrecked and half of their body, as they have been now tossed to the shore, half of their body is still in the water and the other half is on the sand. You and I don't see that. We oftentimes don't know that, but we all have to deal with troubled waters. But here's the thing. Even in troubled waters, one must trust God. One must start to trust God and continue to trust God. And there's three things that uh, I want to highlight to you. The first is in verses 1 through 9. In verses 1 through 9, what we see is what we have to deal with when we're facing life dead ends. When we're facing life dead ends, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of Paharoth, between Magdal and the sea, in front of Baal Zephon, you shall encamp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, they are wandering in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was charged towards the people. And they said, what is this we have done that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his army with him and took 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. The Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them and encamped at the sea by, pa, by Pahaharath and in front of Belzephon. Oh, I got to point something out to you. Listen, I, I get it. I, I really do get excited when you, you get to see all. Listen, some things in the Bible are prescriptive and some things are descriptive. Watch some of these descriptions and watch some of these prescriptions that we're going to recognize. Pharaoh, first of all, in verse 3. Now, remember, the, the Lord told them to take off. He told them where to go. And so Pharaoh says in verse 3, he says of the people, they are wandering in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. Some of your text says they are bewildered in the land. I, I just want you to remember, though, in verses 1 through 2, who told them where to go? God told them where to go, but in verse 3, 
Pharaoh says, listen, they're bewildered. In other words, they don't know where they are. They're just kind of wandering around. You have to understand, they've been in captivity and slavery for hundreds of years. They haven't been anywhere. They've been slaves. And yet, Pharaoh doesn't understand that the Israelites have a GPS. And I, and I know some of you think GPSs came around the last few decades. But the Israelites had a GPS. And I, and I, know, I don't know what GPS stands for you, but for me, GPS stands for God's providential system. And so they had this providential system. God told them where to go. And to Pharaoh, in verse 3, Pharaoh says they're lost. They're wandering around. They don't know what to do. But they are right where God wants them to be. But let me tell you this. Pharaoh thinks that they are confused, but what Pharaoh doesn't understand that God is using this system to actually confuse him. Amen. See, the first thing, that when the enemy thinks he has an upper hand on you and think he understands, he starts with, his, he utilizes his military intelligence and they utilize their education, but what they don't realize is that the king of all kings is actually guiding them and God gives them directions and the directions that he gives them to the common eye, it really doesn't make any sense because there's a shorter route. But God was the one that told them to do this. I got to tell you this, 20 years ago, I didn't see that. God told them where to go, where to be, and now you have Pharaoh says they're bewildered. They don't know where they are. They don't know where they lost. Now, the reality is they don't know where they are. They don't. But God knows where they are, and they're right where God told them to be. They don't know how to get to where they're going, but God has a providential system. Not only that, in verse 4, it says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. In other words, he says, I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. Listen, I, I, I can't tell you how God does all that he does, but I can tell you, tell you this. When God pulls back, because one of the ways that God actually directs us or captures our attention, even before we become saved, is our conscience. God utilizes our conscience that he has given us to point to the fact that he exists. It's one of the reasons why no one would have an excuse when they stand before God if they said, well, no one ever shared the gospel with me. I lived in a foreign country and no one made it here. God says, no, you saw the sun, you saw the moon, you saw the stars, you saw the grass, and these things don't make themselves happen. You also, I gave you a conscience. I also gave you creation to make you understand that in order for those creations to be around you, that there had to be a creator. Amen. So you may not have known my name, but you knew I existed. Wow. He says, I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. And Pharaoh, with his hardens, hardened heart, he is going to pursue after the Israelites. And God says, I'm going to do this that I may receive the glory. And the glory I receive, it will not only be from my people, but glory will be given to me also from my enemies. I don't know if that excites you, but that really excites me because sometimes we're like, God, show me, show me your power. No, you know what, sometimes God, I ask God sometimes, show my enemies your power. You slap them up, you kick them up, you do what you got, but you get glory. I want them to know that you are God and you're God alone. And so he says, I will make it known to them all that I am Lord and Lord alone. In verse 5, he says, when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled and the mind of the Pharaoh's servants were charged, notice what they said. They said, what is this we have done that we have let Israel go from serving us? I just wanted to point that out. All of a sudden, they said to themselves, hold up, we let these people go. These people have been serving us for about 400 years and we let them go. What is wrong with us? Why did we let this whole host of people, we let all these slaves go? What's wrong with us? Well, I ain't going to get into it. I mean, listen, I, I know ain't is not a word. I am not going to get into that today. Because if I did, I could give you 10 reasons why it was good for them to let them go. Y'all don't get it. Dude. Those 10 plagues, I can give you 10 reasons why they should have let them go, and they did let them go. 
And our last one, with all the firstborn dying in the household, that was a pretty good reason for them to let the Israelites go. And so now they're saying to themselves, why did we let these people go? Listen, it's only been a short amount of time, and they have already forgotten the spanking they received. Now, now, listen, I know times are different. And, and, and you know, you all may have kids and you, uh, that, that uh, have never had to get a spanking. Lord bless you. Uh, and then you may be someone that grew up here and you got like three spankings in your life. Me? I kid you not. I always tell people this. My, mama's, my mom has been a Christian a long time, but I was the one that taught my mama how to pray. I did. I taught her how to pray. And just as sure as the sun and the moon went up and down, I was going to get a whoop. And if my mom was standing here, she'd tell you, she told me many times, she says, today I'm going to whoop you for what you're going to do. <laughs> I had such a track record, she had to get ahead of me and go ahead and give it to me in advance. Why? Because I quickly forgot the last one I received. And so I would go right back at it again because in my heart, I was a rebel. You tell me to sit down, I would sit down physically, but in my mind, I was standing up. And she knew it. These Egyptians had quickly forgot what had already taken, what had taken place prior to them. And so now they're asking the question, what have, we're, what, what have we done to let all this slave labor go? And then I just want to highlight one more verse from this. Verse 8. And the Lord, he hardened the Pharaoh, king of Egypt's heart, and he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. And I love that word defiantly. They were being rebels. Like, man, we're we strong now. We're walking with God. Let me tell you, sometime it's okay to be a rebel. That's what I found out. There's nothing wrong with being a rebel. Just be a godly one. There's a time to stand up and fight for what God has told you to fight for. There's a time to stand up and trust in what God has called you to put your faith in him. When he's told you something to do, and even if the whole world says it's the wrong thing to do or not to do it, or you're not qualified to do it, or you don't have the resources to do it, you know what? Be defiant. Be a rebel. Listen, you, listen, walk with God. To the world, you're going to look like you're alone, but you're actually stronger, and it's not because of you. It's because of him. They walked defiantly, and they walked out. The Egyptians pursued after them with their horses and their chariots and their horsemen and his army. You have to understand, and I have to tell you this, those chariots, that army, you're talking about the most powerful nation at the time, the chariots. The chariots were what the submarines were in the beginning of World War II. The chariots were what the planes that the United States provided were at the end of World War II. And when people saw those uh, planes, those bombers at the end of World War II, it was all over. The, 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 it, listen, it was a wrap. Well, the chariots were the most powerful instrument you could use as far as military might during this time. They were like army tanks coming in. And the Pharaoh sent out the military might to chase down these Israelites. And they have all of these horsemen. You have to understand, it's 600 chariots, and all of them have officers on them. And then they even took uh, some chariots that were not of the military caliber, and they put officers on them, and they were pursuing after these Israelites. Here's the thing, though. The Israelites have no chariots. The Israelites have no military training. They have been slaves. They don't even know how to get around. They've been slaves, and here they are being pursued by the military. But watch what happens in, in the next part. In verses 10 through 20, it's about trusting in God's leading. It's one thing to have a GPS system. It's another thing to trust. I don't know about you, but uh, sometimes when I'm riding in the car, uh, and my, my wife is with me, we're trying to get somewhere, and I'm using the GPS, sometimes... 
I got uh, Siri trying to give me some directions, and I got her trying to give me directions. <laughs> and, uh, and I love her, I love her, I love her. But I had to tell her one day, now listen, we pay for Siri to tell me what to do. And she ought to do it right. Your direction is not right. And it's a reason why we don't pay you <laughs> to do it, to give direction. I can't listen to both of you. The problem with many of us as believers, we have more than one GPS system. We have God giving us direction, but we also have the world trying to give us direction. We also have our flesh seeking to give us direction. Then we have our enemy and enemies seeking to give us direction. But there's only one that has accurate, correct directions. And so many of you, when you're trying to make it to a restaurant and you find yourself at someone's house, you might want to check who's actually providing the directions. And I'm telling you, I know you say, well, you know what? When I just listen to myself, I, I get there most of the time. Yes, we get ourselves in trouble most of the time. The only system that is trustworthy is for him. We have to trust God's leading plan. Listen, in verses 10 through 20, I'm just going to highlight some of these. Well, I'm going to read it because you know what? Here's why I have to do it to make sure we read it, all of us. Verses 10 through 20 says this, When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly, and the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For if it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you and you have only to be silent. The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward, lift up your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea, and divide it that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots and his horsemen, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. Yes. When I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen, and then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. So coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel, and there was the cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. I'm just going to tell you a few things from this passage. Just going to explain a few things from this passage. One in verses uh, 12, uh, 11 through 12, about five times the word us is mentioned by the Israelites. Why did you bring us out here to die? Why did you bring us out here, us out here in the wilderness? Why did you bring us out here to be alone? Five times. And if you add in the two we's, it will make it a seven times. In fact, they even asked, wasn't there not enough, was there not enough graves in Egypt? And by the way, one of the things that Egypt is known for highlights is its graves. Even to this day, um, many discoveries are made because of the graves. They were very, very captivated by death. And so here you have the people grumbling and they're complaining because they see these Egyptians pursuing after them and they were afraid. They became afraid, and they cried out, and that's when they went to Moses, complaining, why did you bring us out here? We could have and should have just stayed in Egypt as a slave. 
Let me, let me share something with you. Here's, here's something I want you to really look at. They had been brought out of slavery, but they were still slaves. If you're not careful as a Christian, you can be saved from your old position, but still have the mentality of your old position. You once were dead, but now you are alive. And you have left that behind, but in your mind, if you're not careful, you can think like the dead person that you once were. They were saying, we would have been better off there to die. And they started to cry out to Moses. And I want you to see, remember when I asked you to read those few, first few verses? No, notice this in verses 13. 13, it says, and Moses said to Moses, fear not. Moses was telling them, stop your whining. Stop your complaining. Stop your grumbling. And then he said, Stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord. I, just, just a little takeaway. Write in your notes or somewhere uh, this X factor, S factor. Stop, stand, and see. The next time you find yourself in trouble and you start to become full of fear, stop. Stand and see. Stop, stand, and see. And Moses said, on this day, the Lord is going to deliver us. And he says in verse 14, he's going to fight for you. And all you have to do is be silent. All you have to do is be still. Stop struggling. Stop straining with the fight. It's as if, hey, JC, can I borrow you for a second? So I, so I can just close this point. And JC, if you don't mind, would you just swing? Just, just start swinging at there. Fight, fight. <laughs> just keep on fighting. And, and, and we, we, we don't realize this, but spiritually, this is what we look like oftentimes. We fighting all our, listen, you see, we, we do that spiritually. We do that mentally. We do that emotionally. And guess what? God just steps in and God, God does this. God just stops in and God says, stop. Just stop. And then God says, stand and just see. And when he says that see part, notice what Moses says after that. He's going to fight for you. So you, you don't mind, just keep on until I tell you to. I want you to look at, now watch this X factor. I want you to stop. I want you to stand. I want you to see. I'm going to fight for you. What? Now notice, listen, you, you see that? God's going to, you step back. I, I got this. As God says, I got this. You, you, you just stand there. I got this. I got this. And the problem is, JC, if you don't mind, now listen, I'm going to stop one more time. I'm going to get in front of you. Do you mind coming back in front of me when I get there? You go ahead and fight. <laughs> fight. This is us. I want you, listen, every time Listen, I want you to picture this because this is us spiritually. Stop, stand, see, push back. Now watch what we do sometimes. JC, come on in here. I'm in front. I'm fighting. God, God's fighting. And look, look, look what we do. Stop, stand, see. I'll fight. I'll fight. And here's the beautiful thing about it. When God fights, God gets the glory, not from only the person he's fighting for, but also from the people that God has stood in the fight to fight for you. Amen. Thank you, brother. Amen. Now, let me ask you something. It looked kind of funny watching him do this, right? But that's us spiritually. Stop, stand, see. God's going to fight for you and I. And, and, and watch how he closes with this. I don't know if you all caught this. In verse 15, now remember the people were crying out, right? Y'all heard that part? Verse 15, it says, And the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Did you catch that? He didn't say, Why do the people cry to me? Moses had just told the people what? 
Stop, stay, and see. God's going to fight for you. But here's the thing Moses didn't know. Moses didn't know what God was going to do. And he didn't know how God was going to do it. He just knew that God was going to do something. And so Moses, after telling the people this, one can only imagine, and listen, the text doesn't say it, and I'm not going to say what the text says, but evidently he had a conversation with God, and a conversation with God we know is prayer. He was talking to the Lord, and the Lord said, Moses, why are you crying out to me? Did, did you catch that? Moses, why are we standing here praying about this? Because that's what it comes, why are we praying about this? And he says to him, tell the people of Israel to go forward. In other words, Put some action behind this. And, and listen, there are some things uh, you don't have to pray about. Let me tell you, the Bible tells us to pray. We do not have to pray about should we actually celebrate the Lord's ordinance. The Bible has already told us. We do not have to pray, is it right or wrong to steal? You don't have to pray about that. The Bible has already spoken about it. We do not have to pray if Jesus Christ is the answer. The Bible has already spoken on these things. So God says... Put some action behind that. And so you and I should be actively doing what God tells us to do. And we will be praying, saying, God, let me continue to be a vessel to be used to do it. But God says, tell the people to move forward. Now, here's the crazy thing about it. He moved forward. Move forward into what? There's a sea in front of him. And here's where it gets really beautiful. The Pharaoh's heart is hardened. Those chariots are chasing them down. The arm is chasing them down. And, but Moses trusts God. And that's why it says in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 through 6, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and do not lean to your own understanding, but acknowledge him in all your ways and he will make your and my paths straight. Well, the last point, this is where you see God's miraculous deliverance. Verses 14, chapter 14, verse 21 through 31, Moses stretched out his hand over the sea the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land. And the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went out into the midst of the sea on dry land, on dry, land, on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea. All Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning, watch. The Lord and the pillar of fire and the cloud looked down on the Egyptians' forces and threw the Egyptians' forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, let us flee before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. And then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled into it. The Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and horsemen. Of all the hosts of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, and the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. I just want to tell you in this closing, it's an amazing thing that took place. The Lord was guiding the Israelites through their journey by a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. The pillar of cloud in the daytime, the pillar of fire at nighttime. This is what he had been utilizing to give them guidance on their journey. When the Egyptians got close to them, the angel of the Lord that was unseen, that was in the pillar of the cloud, the pillar of the fire, the pillar of the cloud navigated to the back behind the Israelites as they went into the waters as God parted the waters like when you part your daughter's hair when you're getting ready to twist it up together. And God parted those waters back. And as the Israelites went in, the cloud, the pillar of cloud went behind the back of the Israelites along with the pillar of fire at night. And it was a barrier between the Israelites and the Egyptians. And it act in two different ways. 
For the Israelites, they could see. It was as if it was daytime, the fire. For the Egyptians, they were in darkness, but the Egyptians could not get close to the Israelites. I love that. I don't know about you, but I like knowing this. And this is, a, listen, this is an okay prayer to make. It's okay to pray and say, God, I'm going through something with someone or through something. Would you be my defender between me and that particular issue? Would you get between me and that issue, between me and that problem? Because I don't have the strength to deal with it. And would you continue to give me guidance? God stood between the Egyptians and the Israelites. The Egyptians could not get to the Israelites. The Egyptians could see the same thing that the Israelites could see. That's waters on the left, waters on the right. And they thought to themselves, because the Israelites can walk in as if it's a dry road, we can do the same thing. And so they were going in behind the Israelites and they were walking directly uh, behind them, but that's barrier in between. They couldn't get to the Israelites like they wanted to, just like Satan wants to get to you, like the world wants to get to you. Like society want to get in your household, get in your mind. And God stood right between them. And the Israelites were walking on dry land, but it became muddy for the Egyptians. And their wheels were falling apart. Wheels, they getting stuck in the mud. Their little military tanks were breaking, breaking down. And I love this part. When they got to the end, walking through the Red Sea, because Moses, they found themselves in a difficult situation. Backs, got the Egyptians on them. On the side, you got waters. They also were stuck between two mountains. And all they could do was trust God. And I always say this, I think the scariest thing may have been not what was behind them, but what was in front of them. It was the unknown. But when they got to the other side, God told Moses, I want you to do what I told you to do earlier. I just want you to lift up your hands with that rod. And here's the thing, when he lifted up his hands with that rod, the water, the walls, they started to collapse, these watery walls. And they collapsed on the Egyptians and they wiped out the Pharaoh. They wiped out the chariot. They wiped out the horsemen. They wiped out the entire army. Listen, not one survived. On that day, the Israelites saw the power of God at work. But notice this, before the walls came tumbling down on the Egyptians, notice the Egyptians had said, hey, we need to turn around. We, we need to, listen, we need to flee because the God of God, the, the King of Kings, he fights for the Israelites. All of a sudden, what they had learned earlier when they were back in Egypt, remember those 10 lessons that were taught to them? All of a sudden, it came back to them and they said, oh my goodness, we forgot. But you know what? During those first 10 times, they had, listen, with the first time, they had a second opportunity, right? The third time, they had a fourth opportunity and so forth. But after this 11th lesson, there were not going to be any more exams, no more tests. God wiped every last one of them out. And the people, the Israelites, they not only saw the power of God, but they gave God glory. And they also recognized Moses. And here's the thing, recognizes Moses as a person wasn't the key. Moses was God's representative. It wasn't about Moses. In fact, I want you, listen, don't, don't get it. Listen, don't get confused and think that there was some power in Moses or the rod that he held up. God told Moses to hold up your hands and hold up that rod, and it wasn't Moses that made this happen. It was God that made it happen. He just told Moses, listen, you're going to be active in what I call you to do. Some things God called you to do, you might walk away and say, man, look what I did. No, all God wanted you to do was to trust him. And so when he asked you to do something, it's just he's just asking you, do you have an attitude? Do you have a heart to trust me? Do you have a heart? to actually trust me. When God tells you to apply for a job that you don't feel like you're qualified for, someone else has told you you don't qualify for, and even when they put the job uh, notice out, they said the qualifications at the bottom. It names several degrees, it names several uh, types of experience that you're supposed to have, and you apply for it anyway because God told you to apply for it. 
Now to everyone else, it doesn't make sense. But guess what, you got the job, and I guarantee you, there's someone in this room that ended up with a job or career, and they know good and well that they did not meet the qualifications that was on that paper, but God says, yes, you do. Yes, yes you do. You may think you're not qualified to actually share the gospel with someone. You say, I don't know enough verses. I haven't been saved long enough. Haven't did. Listen, you would be amazed. I've seen people who have been saved less than two days share the gospel with someone else. I saw a young lady who was about 14, 13, 14 years old, accepted Jesus Christ on a Wednesday night as a, a, in student ministry. She was all in tears. And the next day at her school where she invited me and another student pastor to, she was sharing the gospel with one of her friends right there in the cafeteria. And this girl shared the gospel and her friend accepted Jesus Christ. Someone else would say, I'm not qualified. And some of the people who say I'm not qualified have been sitting in a church chair for 20 years. And that young lady shared the gospel. It's not about you. When God calls you and I to do something, and that activity he calls us to do, it's not that activity that's going to bring about the change. It's the power of God. But God just wants to know, are you in lockstep with him? Do you trust him? That's all God's asking you to do. And so it was a learning thing for Moses. It was a learning thing for Israel. It also was a learning thing for the Egyptians. And here's the sad thing. Some people won't get a do-over after they learn. The Egyptians learned, and that's it. The walls came crashing down. I want to close with this thought here. How much do you trust God? How much do you trust God? Do you trust God when you're walking on dry land? Or do you trust God in troubled waters? I want you to write down this day before your eyes close, before you go to bed tonight. Just write down some of the Red Sea moments you have going on in your life. And you ask God to do what he did for the Israelites. And don't be one of the complainers, the whiners. Don't be focused on me or us. Because if you're focused on me and us, you're not focused on the one who actually can guide you through the troubled waters. Father, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we come before you today asking, Lord, that you would turn in our minds and our hearts completely towards you. Help us, Father, to trust you in difficult times, tough times, through trials, through tribulations, through difficult relationships, through financial struggles, through health issues. Father, whatever may be going on, whatever storm may be brewing, whatever issue that may be at hand, Help us, Father, to trust in you. Guide us through troubled waters. Bring us out of troubled waters. And use it all, dear Lord, for your honor and for your glory. It's in Christ Jesus' name we pray.